Okay. So, as I said, I'm grateful for the opportunity to share this time with you as together we explore racism in America, the history we didn't learn in school. I grew up in Wilmington, Delaware, graduating from Mount Pleasant Public High School before going on to earn a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science from Mount Holyoke College. My 27 year career with the DuPont Company in Wilmington culminated with the sale of its medical products business, specifically its medical x-ray business, via a leveraged buyout that created Sterling Diagnostic Imaging, of which I was its first president. I am especially proud of the long-term R&D investment by my business that developed a selenium array for image capture that today is at the heart of virtually every mammography machine in use in the United States. I'm a co-founder of the Westminster Peace and Justice Work Group that was founded in the spring of 2018 with the twin goals of helping to combat violence in the city of Wilmington and uh, promoting racial justice. That work group is affiliated with any number of organizations in the community that share the same goals. And we are so pleased at the opportunity to work collaboratively toward those ends. I grew up in a virtually all white environment until I graduated from high school. The only black person I knew was our mailman, Mr. Brown. Then two significant events occurred. My summer job that year, taking the first Delaware state census, had me going door to door throughout the city of Wilmington, conversing with hundreds of people who didn't look like me. That fall, I found myself on a multiracial campus at the height of the civil rights movement, 1963 to 1967. These experiences launched a journey that continues to this day. I've had a lifelong interest in history and I was a political science history major in college, yet I didn't discover until seven or eight years ago that I was missing a significant portion of our country's history. In my experience, American history covered Columbus, uh, the, the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, um, and a bit of reconstruction with those darn carpetbaggers. And then it picked up again sometime around World War II. So there were huge missing chunks. It was the series of police shootings of unarmed black men that galvanized me to develop a better understanding of how we got here. How did we get where we are? And what I learned is that much of the racial turmoil in our country today can be traced directly to elements of our history, even before the founding of the United States. Many of the racial stereotypes that we hear or hold ourselves are a direct consequence of intentional public and economic policy and biased beliefs that have no grounding in genetics. Other countries with similarly sorted racial pasts have sought to move forward by a process often called truth and reconciliation. I believe America is in desperate need of such a process. So we here together for these six weeks will embark on a search for more truth. Much of it is painful, especially for those of us who profess to believe that everyone is a child of God and that we seek peace and justice for all. I believe that in bringing to light this history of ours that we should have known but didn't, we may be transformed in deeply meaningful ways with a new or renewed urgency to act to finally and truly address the profound inequities that exist in our society today. So let's get started. I'm going to begin with three basic definitions. The first is prejudice, 
an unfavorable opinion formed often without personal knowledge, thought, or reason. And one of the significant contributing factors to prejudice in our society is a consequence of our history of segregation, where we do not know one another. And so when we don't have that personal knowledge, what uh, rushes in to fill the vacuum are stereotypes and images that we read about or hear about. Another phrase is white supremacy. I'm not talking about white supremacists in the sense of those tiki torch carrying, uh, chanting hateful people that we periodically see on the news, but a belief that white people are inherently superior to people of other racial groups, especially black people, and are therefore rightfully the dominant group in any society. And we'll do some exploration of that belief as we move forward. Racism is discrimination directed against a person or a group of people on the basis of their membership in a particular racial or ethnic group. And it is not just racist statements or actions. Racism is a system of prejudice backed by power. So people say, well, can't black people be racist? And the answer in my view is no. They can be discriminatory, they can be hateful, they can dislike white people, but there is no power system that creates a structure or a process that by definition disadvantages white people and advantages people of color. So with that as a backdrop, as we go through this material, I will use a variety of terminology, African, slave, African-American, Negro, Black, Black people, people of color, seeking to be faithful to the time period and the context. Some of these classes include quotations from individuals who use one of the most derogatory terms. And I have gotten feedback from prior classes that uh, there are those who object to the use of that word, even in quotes. And so I will substitute N-word, um, even within a quotation from a historical figure. So what are we going to talk about? Tonight, we are focused on the early years from 1619 in the British colonies through the Civil War and Reconstruction. Next week, we turn to an arena labeled slavery by another name. <clears throat> Noted activist and author Brian Stevenson has famously said, slavery did not end with the Civil War, it evolved. And we will track that evolution during this period of our history. We'll then turn our attention and move into the 20th century and look at various elements of public policy and the impact of the Civil Rights Movement, the causes, the actions, the results. Our fourth class will focus on America's criminal justice system, specifically, triggered by mass incarceration and the war on drugs. Then in week five, we will look at voter suppression back at the beginning up until now. And I guarantee you by week five, there will be more um, to report on than there is today. And then our final class I think is one of the most important because it is my belief that when we know more, we do more. And I believe that once we've come to see all of the history that has led us to this point, it will give us some clarity and some impetus to take action individually or collaboratively with others. And so um, that's the structure of the time that we'll be spending together.
So let's begin. We find ourselves standing on Point Comfort in the British colony of Virginia. It's a hot August day, and we're looking east across the Atlantic Ocean when a ship appears on the horizon, and it's making its way toward us. As it comes nearer, we come to learn that it is a British privateer ship named the White Lion, um, and it has had a difficult crossing from Africa. It has been damaged by storms and it is in need of resupply. So it docks in Jamestown and the captain asks for help with provisioning and repairs and the colonists respond as they frequently do when ships arrive. But this time in compensation for the help that the colonists provide, to the captain and crew so that they can continue their voyage back to Western Europe. The colonists are compensated by receiving 20 plus kidnapped Angolans. And this marks the first point at which African slaves land in the British colonies. Now at the time, much of the commerce is focused on agriculture, particularly in the Southern colonies. And there are not enough, quote, colonists themselves to do the work. And so they have implemented a system of indentured servitude, whereby they recruit poorer Europeans to come to the new world under contract, typically seven years, where uh, the indentured servant will work at no pay uh, receiving room and board. And at the end of that contractual period, the indentured servant is released from the contract, receives um, a plot of land, and is given the opportunity to establish themselves as residents and productive members of the colonial society. So that's the process that's in place when these first kidnapped Angolans arrive. And they are followed by more kidnapped Africans that make up the transatlantic slave trade, which goes on for decades. The leading countries bringing Africans to the New World are Portugal, Great Britain, Spain, France, Holland, and Denmark. And as it continues over time, it becomes an elaborate system of delivering slaves to the new world. And so as the transatlantic slave trade takes hold and is amplified, ships are built specifically for the purpose of bringing slaves to the new world. Ultimately, over time, we learn that more than 20 million people are kidnapped from their villages in Africa. Also, often as a result of tribal wars, they are not necessarily kidnapped specifically for this purpose, but it is how they are utilized. And they are taken to the coast to be put on board these ships. The trip to the coast is no easy process. In fact, while 20 million people are kidnapped for this purpose, only 10.7 million survive to get to the coast. And from that point, they are branded with hot irons and they are restrained with shackles and they are loaded on board these ships. And you see the schematics that describe the ships on which they travel. The living quarters are often a deck within the ship that has less than five feet of headroom. And throughout large portions of the deck, sleeping shelves cut this limited amount of headroom in half. But lack of standing headroom was the least of the slaves' problems. With 300 to 400 people packed in a tiny area, with little ventilation, and in some cases, not even enough space to place buckets for human waste, disease was prevalent. And during the course of the voyages known as the Middle Passage, more than 2 million of the 10.7 million being transported died. So that the largest possible cargo might be carried, the captives were wedged below decks 
chained to low-lying platforms stacked in tiers, and an average individual space allotment that was six feet long, 16 inches wide, and perhaps three feet high. Unable to stand erect or turn over, many slaves died in this position. And there are numerous ship's logs that record the schools of sharks that used to follow these ships because they knew that the corpses would be thrown overboard and serve as food. And so this is the nature of the process that brought Africans to the New World. This middle passage, it was called, because the ships began in Western Europe. They transported goods to Africa that were traded for slaves, that were brought to the New World, that were traded for products that went back to Western Europe. This middle passage period where the slaves were held in this condition could last for anywhere from 21 to 90 days, depending on weather and other circumstances. And so we see the way the slaves were treated and is it little wonder the perceptions and the views of their humanity evolved with time. Initially, they were treated like indentured servants. That was the system in place. And so they fit into that process. And so it's why we will read history that says that there were black people in the early colonies who owned land, who um, had property um, with agricultural pr production and who may even themselves have owned slaves because that was the way they entered the economic system. But quickly, differentiation began to take hold, and it was based on skin color. While initially they were part of the indentured servitude system, the reality was that the Europeans were, uh, were covered by English common law but the Africans were not. And so the freedom and the protections of uh, English common law did not afford any protection to these Africans. And further, the church mandated that all Christians must be treated as free people, but that did not apply to the Africans. Even if they converted to Christianity, they were not seen as deserving of the same degree of freedom that the church conveyed on Europeans. And so the differentiation began to take hold. And that led to a process of legalizing slavery in the colonies. It began in 1641, the first, uh, the first colony to legalize slavery was actually Massachusetts. And the last was Georgia in 1750. And this was by passing a series of laws that described these black people. It said that they were chattel, that they were property, that they were owned for life. There was no contractual period satisfied. Once a slave, always a slave. And further, that's the condition of slavery was hereditary and it passed by way of the mother. That was counter to every um, legacy law in place in the Western world at that time where everything um, descended through the father, but not the condition of slavery. That was determined by the mother. And so the more children, the mother, the woman bore, the more slaves were created for the system. And on average, remember life expectancy was considerably less then than now, but on average, a slave woman would deliver nine children, nine new slaves for the system during her life. Now in the North, it was not an agricultural system. Um, and there the slaves were typically house servants or even unpaid skilled labor, because many of these people brought from Africa actually were artisans um, or skilled craftsmen. And so uh, the economy utilized their skills, 
but they weren't compensated for them, that were, they were still considered the property of their owner. And even in the North, they were relegated to a subhuman status, a less than fully human person. They were not taught to read or write. In many states, colonies and states, it was against the law to teach a slave to read or write, and they were not allowed to marry. There was no marital connection or bond. Uh, there were no birth certificates issued for slaves. Many of them had no last name, uh, or if they did, the last name was the name of their owner. And so a new identity began to develop based on the social construct of race. And along with it, to justify the treatment, a myth of racial inferiority developed and it persisted as a justification for this system because how could you treat another human being this way? And as time went on and we moved toward the formation of the United States of America where all men are created equal, there had to be some inferiority factor or differentiating factor that meant that these male slaves did not fit into that philosophy. And we see in 1671, the first print reference in the new world to white people. Because up until now, when people from Western Europe came to the new world, they were British or German or Dutch or Italian. There was an ethnic identification but it was only after slavery began to assert itself as a system in the colonies that the differentiation between black and white became reality. And initially the term white only applied to Anglo-Saxons. And that continued for quite some time because in later decades and centuries, as Irish people came to the US, as Italian people came to the US, they, were able to assimilate into the white race, but they didn't start that way. They were viewed negatively when they arrived, but that assimilation process was open to them in ways that it was not open to the slaves, to the people from Africa. You know, when I started doing this research, I didn't talk about Bacon's Rebellion. I didn't know what Bacon's Rebellion was. Um, it happened in 1676. But what I came to see is how pivotal that event was to something that exists in our society and is hugely detrimental even today. The backdrop is that Nathaniel Bacon was a wealthy white planter and he was a relative of Virginia's governor, William Berkeley. But the two men didn't like each other. They didn't get along and they had very different views of what should be done in the colony of Virginia. Nathaniel Bacon wanted the colony to retaliate by, against raids by Native Americans by driving them all out of the colony. But the governor feared that doing that would unite the tribes against the colonists and create a situation that they would not be able to manage. And so they couldn't reach an agreement and Nathaniel Bacon organized his own militia and it was made up of poor white people poor black people and enslaved black people. And together they began attacking the Native American tribes. There was backlash from the governor and his militia and the two fought one another. And it culminated in September, 1676 when Nathaniel Bacon's militia captured Jamestown and burned it to the ground. A month later, Nathaniel Bacon died and the rebellion fell apart. But Virginia's wealthy planters observed the danger that occurred when poor white and poor black and enslaved black people joined forces against the elite. And so the planter class began passing laws that made minor differentiations between poor white and poor black people and gave poor white people certain advantages, never able to reach the planter class, but they distinguished between the value 
of being white and poor versus being black and poor. And that mindset and that circumstance plays out today as we see poor white people in many instances voting against their own best interest because otherwise it would be something that helps black people and it's maintained that distinction. So this minor event has huge ripple effects in our country even today. So as we move forward more than a century, beginning in 1774, the Northern colonies and states begin to abolish slavery. It's less efficient in the North, it's less essential, and it's less socially accepted. And so abolishing slavery, forming the abolition movement is not a difficult call in the North, but because slave labor is essential to the agricultural economic system in the South, the same cannot occur there. And so we then come to the creation of the United States and the drafting of the Constitution and its adoption. There was a lot of compromise that had to go on in order to create that instrument. And much of the compromise involved the northern and southern colonies slash states. <clears throat> One of the pivotal issues was congressional representation. Because the Constitution was written that your representation in Congress as a state was a function of your population. And so the South wanted slaves to be counted in the population because it would give them a stronger voice in congressional action. Of course, the North did not want that to happen because they saw that they would be disadvantaged. So the compromise was to write into the Constitution of the United States that a slave counts as three-fifths of a person, not a whole person, three-fifths. A corollary, Native Americans count as nothing. Interestingly, in all of our founding documents, Native Americans are only referred to one time. It's in the Declaration of Independence where they are described as merciless Indian savages. And we will see the consequences of that as well. There are two other aspects written into the Constitution. One was a fugitive slave clause written into the Constitution that says if a slave escapes from a state that allows slavery into a free state, it is the obligation of those around him or her to return the escaped slave to his or her owner. And it turned out that that was not sufficient in the way of describing what the South wanted to happen. So in 1793, Congress passed the Fugitive Slave Act that authorized governments to seize and return escapees to their owners and imposed penalties on anyone who aided in their flight. And at the same time, Southern states began forming slave patrols that would go into free states and look for black people and uh, forcibly return them to their owners. And one of the interesting elements of our history is that in a very meaningful way, these slave patrols were one of the pivotal bases of future law enforcement organizations and police forces. They were grounded in the slave patrols. Further, written into the US Constitution um, was a requirement regarding the importation of slaves. In 1808, the US Congress outlawed the importing of slaves, said we will not do that anymore. Now, the law didn't necessarily mean that the importation of slaves would cease. It was illegal, but it didn't necessarily stop, but it did slow significantly. And the reason for the 1808 date is that written into the constitution is the requirement that should the government decide to stop the importing of slaves, they had to wait at least 20 years before from the ratification of the constitution to stop the transatlantic slave trade. 
So they authorized, explicitly authorized that continual importation of slaves for 20 years. Once it ostensibly stopped, there was still a need for more slaves. And so what developed was a domestic trade in slaves and an increased focus on a self-reproducing labor force, more slave babies. And this began the auction process that became a key part of the movement of slaves in our country. And over the period of time that the slave trade continued, more than 1.2 million slaves were sold at auction. Families were split up. Approximately half of all slaves were separated from their children or their parents as the individuals were sold to new owners. A third of marriages were broken up as one or the other or both were sold. And there was a huge movement from the upper South to the lower South where there was greater value and it was harder to escape. And so by 1860, Montgomery, Alabama had more slave trading locations than churches and hotels put together. Here's an example of an announcement on a bulletin board, a billboard, in a newspaper, the Great Negro Mart in Memphis. The undersigned would announce to the community at large that they will keep constantly on hand a general assortment of Negroes at private sale and at auction. And so it was a regular part of commerce in these states. And Charleston, South Carolina, became the slave trading capital of all of North America. Here is a representation of a sale that is documented in the African American History Museum in Washington, DC for sale. Mary Jane, about 11, Martha, about 10, Louisa, about seven, Priscilla, about nine, all children, of Judy for sale. Imagine being Judy. And their ages are about, because I mentioned, as I mentioned, there are no birth certificates for slaves. Um, there are no full names for slaves, which meant even after the end of the Civil War, when people sought to find their relatives, they basically had no way of identifying them. So, Let's take a look at the economic imperative of slavery in the South. As I mentioned, um, tobacco was um, the initial major crop in the Southern colonies and states, but it was very hard on the land. It, it leached the nutrients from the soil uh, at a rapid rate and made it very difficult to replant tobacco again and again in the same space, which is one of the things that led the westward expansion of the United States to be able to, to uh, have tobacco crops in more and more fields. And so the coastal colonies moved to cotton as a crop. And um, I think we've probably all seen the photographs of the slaves bent over with the burlap bags, bags around their necks as they're picking cotton. A tremendously labor intensive um, occupation, but not just the picking of it because once you had it, the pieces parts of the bowl, the very sharp pieces had to be separated from the fiber in order to be able to process it and turn it into fabric. And so there was a self-limiting ability to do that secondary process once the cotton was picked until 1793 when Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin. And it mechanized the process of separating those sharp pieces from the fiber. And the demand increased and the ability to produce it increased and the colony shifted to a textile economy. So that by the mid 1800s, cotton was America's leading export across the world. This tension between slave holding states and non-slave non owning states continued to intensify. And it led in 1820 to the passage of the Missouri Compromise. 
At the time, Missouri was a territory and it wanted to enter the United States. But at that moment, there was a balance between the number of states that allowed the ownership of slaves and those that did not. And Congress did not want that balance upset. And so the Missouri Compromise provided that a section of Massachusetts would be carved out and become the state of Maine. And Maine would join the Union as a free state to balance Missouri joining as a slave state. And further, the Missouri Compromise decreed that there would be no slave owning states going forward north of the latitude 3630. You may even have heard the phrase 3630 or fight. But the attempt by Congress to, to stop the expansion of slavery was embedded in the Missouri Compromise. But it didn't really solve the problem because the tension still existed as more and more territories sought to join the Union. And so 35 years later, under the auspices of Senator Stephen Douglas, uh, the Kansas-Nebraska Act was passed by Congress, and it basically repealed the Missouri Compromise. Um, and it said any state wishing to join the union may do so, and then that state, once admitted, can decide based on popular vote whether or not it will allow the ownership of slaves. And so that was the end of that uneasy balance. At the time, there were two major parties in the United States, the Democrats and the Whigs. But the Kansas-Nebraska Act caused a schism in the Whig party and the Northern Whigs couldn't tolerate this allowing this expansion of slavery. So they formed the Republican party. The Republican party was not opposed to slavery per se, they were opposed to the continuing expansion of slavery. And so we lead to the period of um, a momentous Supreme Court decision. We are gonna hear about a number of really pivotal Supreme Court decisions in our history. And this is the first, the Dred Scott case. Dred Scott was born about the turn of the century, 1799 in Virginia. And he was owned by Peter Blow. And his owner would take him traveling to various states. Some were slave states, some were free states. Um, nothing fundamentally changed, but Peter Blow died in 1832 and Dr. John Emerson bought Scott and eventually took him to Illinois, a free state, and then to the Wisconsin territory, also free. But then Dr. Emerson died and his widow, acquired, inherited the slaves. And Dred Scott went to her and went to court and said, my wife and I have traveled to free states. We have been free. We want to sue for the right to remain free. And she refused. And so the case worked its way through local and state courts um, for years. Sometimes, Dred Scott was granted his freedom. Sometimes that was overturned. And so ultimately in 1854, he appealed his case to the United States Supreme Court. The trial began in February of 1856 and the court finally issued its decision in 1857. And it basically said that um, the Missouri Compromise that dealt with these free and slave states was unconstitutional because it was depriving people of their property without due process. It was declaring slaves free. That was depriving them of their property. It was unconstitutional. It further said that blacks, whether slave or free, could never be citizens. They had no federal rights. It is widely considered the worst decision ever rendered by the Supreme Court, although I would argue there have been a couple here lately that might vie for that distinction, but we'll leave, we'll leave that one alone for the moment. In his majority opinion, Chief Justice Taney wrote, in the opinion of the court, 
the legislation and histories of the times, and the language used in the Declaration of Independence show that neither the class of persons who had been imported as slaves nor their descendants, whether they had become free or not, were then acknowledged as part of the people, as intended to be included in the general words used in that memorable instrument, we the people. They had for more than a century before been regarded as beings of an inferior order and altogether unfit to associate with the white race, either in social or political relations, and so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect and that the Negro might justly and lawfully be reduced to slavery for his benefit. The Supreme Court. And so here we are, it's 1860, and by now 80% of the GDP of the entire United States is tied to slavery. The economic value of the 400, of the 4 million slaves living then was um, determined to be about three and a half billion dollars in contemporary value more than the invested value of all the railroads, factories, and banks in the United States. And so the presidential election of 1860, Abraham Lincoln is elected president. I didn't realize until I did some um, searching that there were four candidates for president that year. Um, Abraham Lincoln was the sole Republican candidate. He got 1.8 million votes. There were two Democratic candidates who together got 2.8 million votes, but neither one of them got more than Lincoln. And so Abraham Lincoln was named the president of the United States. And within three months, seven Southern states had seceded, followed by four more, followed by Missouri and Kentucky. We hear discussion of whether the Civil War was caused by states' rights or by slavery. And there are passionate opinions on both sides. The reality is it was fought over both, but it was the integral link between states' rights and slavery that tipped the balance. And to, to understand that and to resolve the question, we need only look at the historical record for example, at the Articles of Secession that were written by the states. Mississippi's is one example. Our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interest of the world. Its labor supplies the product which constitutes by far the largest and most important portions of commerce of the earth. These products are peculiar to the climate verging on the tropical regions. And by an imperious law of nature, none but the black race can bear exposure to the tropical sun. I suppose this was before the period of Caribbean vacations, but anyway. These products have become necessities of the world and a blow at slavery is a blow at commerce and civilization. That blow has been long aimed at the institution and was at the point of reaching its consummation. There was no choice left us but submission to the mandates of abolition or a dissolution of the union whose principles have been subverted to work out our ruin. And even more significantly, barely three weeks before the start of the Civil War, Alexander Stevens, who was the vice president of the Confederacy, gave what came to be known as the cornerstone speech. And he said the new constitution, that is the uh, Confederate constitution, has put at rest forever all the agitating questions relating to our peculiar institutions, African slavery as it exists among us, the proper status of the Negro in our form of civilization. This was the immediate cause of the late rupture and current revolution. The general opinion of the men of that day, he was talking about the revolutionary time period, was that somehow or other in the order of providence, the institution of slavery would be evanescent and pass away. 
our new government is founded upon exactly the opposite ideas. Its foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race is his natural and normal condition. And so in 1861, the Civil War began. In January of 1863, Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, which freed the slaves in the 10 states that were still in rebellion. It did not free the slaves in the border states like Delaware and Maryland. It was able to be enacted because it dealt with the property of an enemy combatant. It was not because it afforded human freedom. It was because we were at war and Lincoln had the right to take the property of enemy combatants. And that action, while not immediate, ended up depriving the South of much of its labor force and its ability to prosecute the war. And so ultimately in 1865, General Lee surrendered to General Grant. That war left 620,000 soldiers dead that is more than the sum of soldiers who have died in the total of every other war the United States has ever fought. And one and a half million significant casualties resulted. That was the death of about 2% of the total population of the United States at that time. And including the casualties, it was seven or 8% of the total population of the United States that were affected. And so now we come to Reconstruction, a pivotal period about which I contend we know relatively little. As I mentioned, when I remember the Reconstruction taught as part of American history, the main thing I remember is that there were carpetbaggers who came south to profit from the circumstances that arose. But in reality, the period of Reconstruction offered a ray of hope for a more perfect union for equity, for equality, um, such hope for a period of time until it was snuffed out. It began with the passage of the 13th Amendment that abolished slavery with an asterisk. And we will talk about that asterisk more next week. It was passed by Congress in January of 1865 before the Civil War even ended and it was ultimately ratified in December of 1865. But not all the states were on board. Delaware had to think about it for a while. So Delaware ratified the 13th Amendment in 1901. I think they wanted to wait for a new century. Uh, Kentucky took a while longer. Kentucky ratified the 13th Amendment in 1976. And then Mississippi. Mississippi ratified the 13th Amendment, acknowledging the ab abolition of slavery in 2013. So imagine being a Black resident of Mississippi, knowing that your state has not yet gotten around to asserting that um, you um, could rightfully be held as a slave. In that same year, the Freedmen's Bureau was established. It took control of confiscated and abandoned lands. It uh, was responsible for educational programs and relief activities for those formerly enslaved to help give them a decent economic footing for moving forward as citizens of the United States. That same year, the Ku Klux Klan was founded in Pulaski, Tennessee, which took the opposite tack. Andrew Johnson, who succeeded Abraham Lincoln after his assassination, was no fan of equal rights and emancipation. He was a great sympathizer with the white supremacists in the South, and he pardoned over 7,000 secessionists and uh, rescinded the land grants that were made to those formerly enslaved, requiring a move to an economic system known as sharecropping. He opposed black voting rights and as a consequence, encouraged the violence that took place at that time. 
it got to be so difficult that Congress stepped forward and passed what were known as the Reconstruction Acts in 1867 over Andrew Johnson's veto. And it created five military districts for those 10 states to help ensure that the 13th and ultimately 14th and 15th amendments were enforced in those states. In 1868, the 14th Amendment asserted that those formerly enslaved were indeed citizens of the United States and entitled to due process, just like our white citizens. That, you think, would have meant the ability to vote, but the pressures to keep Black people from voting were overwhelming and required the adoption and ratification of the 15th Amendment in 1870 that specifically said that a vote right to vote cannot be denied based on race, color, or condition of previous servitude. That year, of the eligible Black voters, more than 90% took part in the elections. And we began to see African Americans being elected to Congress, to state uh, legislatures, to executive agencies, where they worked in concert with their white counterparts on legislation and government. And there was a hope, a hope that this might indu indeed be a turning point. But the tide began to turn. In 1872, Congress passed the Amnesty Act that allowed all former Confederate leaders to run for office. They had been denied that opportunity earlier in Reconstruction, but as of 1872, they could run for office yet again. And the ultimate event was the election of 1876, where Samuel J. Tilden, the governor of New York, was running against Rutherford B. Hayes of Ohio. When the uh, electoral votes were submitted, the first round um, was not complete. The votes of three states were un, uh, being contested, but with the ones that were submitted, Samuel J. Tilden was one electoral vote short of being named president. But Congress created a federal election electoral commission consisting of 15 members of Congress and the justices of the Supreme Court. And the Republicans on that commission outnumbered the Democrats eight to seven. And so they made a deal that if Rutherford B. Hayes would promise to end Reconstruction, they would name him the president of the United States. And so he did, and they did, and Rutherford B. Hayes became president all of the federal reconstruction oversight and initiatives were removed. And we moved beyond that ray of hope, that moment of opportunity um, that has not recurred. I'm going to stop the recording.